sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Amen. Amen. Please our, remain standing. Our first hymn will be at the cross. Please remain standing. saw the light at the foot of the cross all are welcome at the foot of the cross it's saying come as you are at the cross it is saying we will take you as you are there's no resume required there's no credit report required at the cross where we first see the light and all of our burdens are rolled away. Let us have a prayer of invocation, every head bowed. Most gracious Father, we come this day to recognize the goodness of Good Friday. We come this day, Lord God, to recognize your journey to the cross. We come this day, Lord God, to recognize your resurrection power. We come this day, Lord God, to acknowledge what you did for each and every one of us on the cross. Lord God Almighty, let us embrace your journey. Let us embrace and acknowledge all that you did for us on this Good Friday. It is a Good Friday because it is the goodness of the Lord and all that he has done for us. So Lord, keep us focused. Keep us focused on your journey. Keep us focused, Lord God, on your goodness and all that you have done for us 
So, Father, as we go through this Good Friday, let us acknowledge the goodness that you've done for us, not just on today, but down through the years, you have been good. You have been mighty good. So we acknowledge your sovereignty. We acknowledge the greatness of this day. So Father, we prepare ourselves to hear your last words. May these last words impact us in a more profound and powerful way today. We thank you and we praise you. It is in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Our scripture is Luke 23, verse 33 and 34. It's Luke 23, verse 33 and 34. And it reads thusly, And when they came, and when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. seated. Our first word comes from Reverend Fatima Blakely. And the first word is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Reverend Fatima Blakely. We will have a hymn and then the scripture and then a sermon. Amen. Now listen, we can't start like this, okay? <laughs> Woo. Okay, okay. So good morning. New prospect. You know, it's good to be here one more time. One more time. Good Friday, good Friday. Yes, Lord. So we will bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I don't hear y'all. Come on. This is the day that the Lord, thank you, that the Lord has made. Come on, y'all. We are so blessed to be here today. I know I only got 10 minutes, but we have to learn that every moment of every day, that we got to bless him, okay? We got to let him know that we appreciate what he did for us. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, we come to you at this hour, at this time, thanking you and praising you for you are good. Lord, we realize that without you, we are nothing. So, Father God, we thank you for shedding your blood on Calvary. We thank you, Father God, for forgiving us. Oh, God, we just need you in a mighty way. 
Open our spiritual ears, Lord, so that we can hear from you on today. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let us reflect on God's great love. I want y'all to clear your minds and, and let's just know how great God is today for us, for you, and for me. And so my assignment is the first word. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These were the first words uttered from Jesus' lips while dying on the cross. So tell your neighbor that sometimes it ain't that easy to let it go. It ain't that easy. All right? Now you might say, well, woman of God, I have heard a lot of sermons on forgiveness, and I know I'm supposed to let it go. I know I'm supposed to just sweep it under the rug. But you don't know what my ex did to me. And you don't know what she did to me. And you don't know what she said about me and how ugly it got. And I just can't forget how much they hurt me and how much they lied on me. And, and you don't know the dirt they did to me and how very embarrassing it was. And when I sit back and think about it, even though I know it went down in 1999, I still feel some kind of way, all right? I feel some kind of way about that. Like it was just yesterday. Okay, that's how we do. See, I can remember everything they did, every word that came out of their mouths, every ounce of pain and hurt and bitterness. Is there anybody in here today that ever had some folk do you wrong? And as much as you love the Lord and as big as your Bible is and as many scriptures you can quote and as many hymns you can sing and, and oh, you've been in church all your life, but let the truth be told. There are some things some people have done to you that's just too hard to let it go. And it ain't that easy to let them off the hook. All right? So if you keep on living, you're going to find out that every day, Satan anoints and sends somebody to offend you on a daily basis. Every day, somebody's sole purpose is to wake up to burden and hurt your feelings just to keep you from the blessing God has for you. See, if you keep on living, somebody going to lie on you. And if you keep on living, somebody going to throw you under the bus. And if you keep on living, somebody going to say something out of pocket, and you just might want to hurt somebody and send them straight back, okay, to where they came from. And that ain't what I wanted to say. But I know I have to be careful. See, I don't like it when people try to play on my top or play with my mind, okay? Because I have learned that people are assigned to weigh you down with bitterness and Satan tries to play in your face. And if you find that you are struggling with forgiving people who offend you, remember what Jesus' first words at the cross were. Forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So remember, as Jesus hung there on the cross, enduring so much pain, bleeding, and in agony, and we can only imagine that he had to lift himself up to breathe in and be able to say, forgive them, Father, as he had to expand his diaphragm to get the words out. That could not have been easy for Jesus, but he wants you to know today no matter how bad you have been hurting and how deep the pain flows and how bad you may have been wounded and you can remember the very minute you had been offended, forgiveness has to be our goal. I remember my grandmother, she gave me a recipe for black don't crack. She said that you got to let it go. She said, you don't hold on to hatred and bitterness and jealousy because those things will kill your soul, your very soul, and destroy your mind. Okay? 
Granny was my ride or die, y'all. She had my back. See, the longer you carry around that unforgiveness in your heart, all that it does is keep you in bondage. It keeps your mind in captivity, and it keeps that situation controlling you. So you must remember that you have to forgive them because Jesus died on that cross to forgive you and your sins. So here we're being taught, Jesus teaches us to forgive, and he's teaching us to forgive even while he's dying on the cross. Now Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, watch this, says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how long will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I don't know what to say to you about seven times, but it's 77 times. Can y'all imagine? <laughs> okay. Then, then we're going to go to the Lord's Prayer. And he says, if you don't forgive others, God can't forgive you. So we see Jesus dying on the cross, and we hear him say, can't you hear him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, I really want you to hear Jesus. So repeat after me. Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So you got to get it in your spirit, because you don't know what you're going to walk into when you walk out these doors. See, right here, when it comes down to me, <laughs> after you've done some shady stuff, back in the day, of course, I might not be ready to talk to you just yet, okay? Because I can't deal with folk, or I couldn't deal with folk who hurt me and lied on me and deceived me. So before I said anything to you, I needed to have a little talk with the Father because this forgiveness is something I need God to help me with because I can't do it in my own strength. That's where true forgiveness begins, and then you can say to your haters and your backstabbers and the so-called friends, I'm not ready to talk to you yet, but I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to have a little talk with the Father about you. See, I haven't let it go yet, but I'm praying about it, okay? Just give me a few minutes to pray, and, 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 and then we can see what God is going to do with it. Then, and only then, will I be able to deal with you and forgive you like Christ forgave me. Isn't it a beautiful thing when you don't have to go through life by yourself? I just love me some Jesus. Y'all love Jesus? I just love Jesus. Amen? So, saints, I, I just stopped by to tell you in my 10 minutes that sometimes forgiveness can be so hard that you got to have God with you. So, you know, I researched these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, and I'm trying to live according to my God's precepts. And I found that in Luke 5, 17 through 26 says, Jesus forgave the sins of a man paralyzed and couldn't walk. And he said to the man, rise and pick up your bed and go home. He was forgiven. Then, then I went over to Luke chapter 23, 39 and 43, and read about how Jesus forgave the sins of a thief who asked to be remembered in paradise. See, I just want you to know when life gets too hard for you to forgive in your own strength, call on the Father to help you. Now, the first book of James, I know y'all know it, verses 2 and 3, says to count it all joy. See, I'm still trying to understand that. I, I, I know y'all probably do, but it says to count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials and tribulations of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Amen? Amen. 
So as I close, I want you to know that I'm so glad I get to walk the Christian journey with a forgiving, loving God. See, I don't know about you, but when people do you wrong, and because of the grace of God that's new every day, I didn't call my cousins from the east side to come and pay you a visit or send that email that could have sent your world into a total chaos. Or, or maybe I could have had my Pookie and Ray Ray do a drive-by and set it off, right? But I'm so glad I got King Jesus. I'm so glad he changed my heart. And I'm so glad Jesus stayed on that cross, amen? He completed his assignment for you and for me. So let's not forget how Jesus prayed also on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane and how he fell on his face and prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, nevertheless, not his will, but God's will. So I'm so glad Jesus held back some things that was meant for me and you, because if he had not held back, we wouldn't be sitting here today, okay? Aren't you glad about it that out of all the stuff we did, that he loved you and me so much, he died on the cross, calling to the Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can't you just hear him? Can't you hear him from the cross? Father, Father, oh, forgive them for they know not what they do. So thank you, O great King of kings and Lord of lords, that you set us free from sin, that you pardon our sins by dying on that cross. And what a mighty God we serve. Amen.
We want to give Reverend Fatima another hand for that presentation that she did. God will use each of our pastors, reverends, and ministers in their own way. Yeah. But we just thank God for the opportunity to be used yeah. in the service of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. It's a calling that is most profound. It's a calling that we should not take lightly. Yeah. If he called us to serve, we need to serve diligently, righteously, and with all honesty. Amen? Amen. And if the Lord God Almighty can forgive the two thieves on the cross, what are we waiting for? Cross the aisle in the parking lot, in our individual ministries. Ask God to give us the spirit of forgiveness. We want to thank Reverend May Alexander and our musicians and our soloists for bringing Songs of Zion, and I'm thanking them in advance. So let's focus on what took place on Good Friday. Our second word says, I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Our second sermon in reference to the second word will be delivered by Reverend Dr. Brenda Jackson. Good afternoon, criminals. Oh, yes. Remember that. Let us pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, as I come to you this afternoon, asking you to use me, give your word through me, give your illumination through me to your people. You are my strength. Use me, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. You laughed when I said, hello, criminals, but you know that's how we were born. Issue is, today, which criminal are we? As it says, our scriptures are coming from the Gospel of Luke, Luke 23, 39 through 43. Some key points I want you to remember as we go through this last word. Grace can be given at the time of dying. All right. All right. Salvation can be received during any time of your living. Yes. And faith in Jesus is the only thing, the only one who can take us to an eternal home. I want to read these scriptures to you again so you'll get it in your mind. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Luke is the author of this gospel. Probably a Gentile by birth, well educated in the Greek culture. In fact, he was a physician. He was a companion of Paul on many occasions and was one who stayed with Paul when others decided to leave. The recipient of this gospel was someone named Theophilus, whose name means one who loves God. He was a patron supporter for Luke, wanted to make sure that the writings got copied and they got distributed. His key message was to strengthen the faith of believers and to answer the attacks of the unbelievers. When we look at the background of this conversation that took place on the cross, demonstrates how God triumphed over injustice. True divine justice was demonstrated. We know that the innocent will die while the guilty get set free. That happened before he even got on the cross. You remember Barabbas? This is the first picture of the significance of Jesus' death as he prepared for his departure. And then in Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 53, 1 through 12, states that in death, Jesus would be numbered among the transgressors. In death. You know, he was numbered among us. Remember that. Keep that on your mind. It was no accident that Jesus was being crucified between two thieves, it shows a division of opinion then and now. You either believe or you don't believe. It shows a picture of eternal life that only Jesus can give. One thief representing eternal condemnation Think about it, which, where are you? <laughs> One thief represents everlasting life. Being crucified with criminals shows us our position. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus paid our debt for our sin. He was a sacrifice. According to a theologian, Arthur Pink, the three crosses on the spirit on, or states, as they are called in Hebrew Bible, represent three biblical concepts. Number one, a sinner reviling and rejecting Christ. I was there. Were you? A sinner repenting and believing. That's where I am now. Where are you? But the best part, a Savior redeeming and saving. Hallelujah. It was providential that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Now let's look at the picture. Both thieves had equal access to the Savior on the cross. Both could read the subscription which read, it was written in three languages, I know they saw one of them. <laughs> this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. They read it, but today we got our Bible sitting on the table and haven't opened it since when? Think about it. Both thieves had to be guilty of using violence in their crimes because they were sentenced to death on a stake. Luke records the abuse that Jesus received from one of the criminals as he hung on the cross. He was imitating the religious leaders. He was using the same mockery that the religious leaders at that time used against Jesus, abused Jesus verbally, and then had the nerve to say, you should take me down from the cross. The second male factor took courage and came to the defense of Jesus. He defied the other criminals. He defied the mockery of the crowd. He acknowledged that Jesus was innocent. Maybe he reasoned. If this man is indeed the Christ, 
if this man indeed has a kingdom, if this man has saved others, he can meet my need because I definitely need salvation. Amen. Salvation of the dying thief portrays victorious grace, as it tells us in Ephesians 2.8. The dying thief who received salvation, he had no good works before he went to the cross. He had no good works when he left the cross. But he had salvation, saved by grace. Oh, hallelujah. The thief's conversation took place before any of the real supernatural events happened on the hill of Golgotha. That thief heard the word when Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He heard the taunts against Jesus while Jesus was praying. The thief had knowledge of his own guilt but believed in Jesus before those three hours of darkness hit that hill. He knew before Jesus cried, it is finished. He knew before the veil in the temple was torn. He knew before the earth shook with that earthquake and some people came to visit them from the grave. Before the sincerian's confession, he knew. The thief knew the difference between himself and Jesus. He knew he was guilty. Do you remember when you finally admitted your guilt? He confessed his guilt. Do you remember when you confessed your guilt before you came down that aisle? He knew Jesus didn't deserve punishment and was innocent. Did we know? Did we know? He acknowledged his deserved punishment. That's one thing that we don't really deal with. Punishment, I'm going to heaven. But you have to remember you did deserve punishment. The thief's repentance towards God was accompanied with faith towards our Lord, Jesus Christ, because he confessed him as Jesus Christ. We have to acknowledge ourselves as male factor before we can be adopted into God's family. Knowledge that Jesus is has to come first, followed by faith in and on Jesus Christ that he is the Son of God. Many are at step one. They have some knowledge, but they haven't moved on to the rest of it. Spiritual belief is part of the illumination given to the thief and all believers. Belief in eternal life, sight of our own sinfulness, testified about Christ's sinlessness. We believe in his saviorhood, our Lord and our savior, Jesus the Christ. Believed in his kingship. We look forward to his return. But there are still those other thieves, then and now. Although he was dying, he derides our suffering savior. He epitomized human depravity. He demonstrates the enmity of the carnal mind against God, the mind of Christ he did not have. He focused on preserving this physical body that is going back to dust. Although guilty, he did not acknowledge that he deserved judgment. He failed to share the cross of Jesus and gain eternal life. Jesus' response to the criminal, I tell you the truth today. Jesus said, I'm going to give you reality. We do know that Jesus is the truth. Amen. Truth that is faithful. Truth that is established. Truth that is reliable. Yeah. Truth that is trustworthy. Yeah. Truth that said when you were born in sin and sentenced to death at birth, he said, I give you the truth. You have been pardoned and you can go and be given eternal life. He told the thief, 
this day, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus tells us we got survival of the soul spirit to be with him. The thief went from the cross to paradise. He went in fellowship with Christ. As Paul has said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus promised the criminal he would be a companion to the king. Walking with Jesus to Christ. Walking in the garden of heaven. To be ever with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, is the goal of all of our hopes. We will walk with him. People always say what they're going to ask and do. We're going to be so glad when we get up there, we're just going to be running out. And that's all there is to it. Eternal life. A reference to the quality or character of our current existence. Eternal life references our future to be enjoyed. We'll be in an endless now. There's no, won't be a yesterday. There won't be a tomorrow. That's why you don't need the sun and the moon, because you just got Jesus. <laughs> Believers have already started on the journey. You got that inner peace that nobody understands but you and the Lord. Sometimes we don't understand, Lord, how did I get it? But he gives it to us. Where will you spend eternity? One criminal and all of us out there will be strolling with Jesus in his new heaven. I pray that that is a future for all of us. In conclusion, I read the words at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. My God's word at last, my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law, I spurned. To my guilty soul imploring, turn to Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the place that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. At Calvary, mercy was so great and grace was so free. Pardon was multiplied to me there. My burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. When the time comes, fellow criminal, I tell you the truth, what Jesus said. This day, you will be with me in Paris. Oh, Lord, 
joy we share as we take breathing is like no other has ever And the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave. Is within my heart ringing, and he talks with me, and he walks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. Oh, and the joy, the joy we share as we tarry there. It's like no other. Bless God today for these wonderful sermons that we are receiving. Thank you, Sister Housie, for that beautiful rendition. And thank you so much for Rev. Dr. Brenda for your dynamic presentation of this second word. Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Just a marvelous, thorough sermon in reference to the second word. So we have to ask ourselves, have we confessed? <laughs> Do we have fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And are we on the right highway to journey to paradise? Amen. Our third word today will be rendered by our own Reverend Ozell McCarter. And it states, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And the scripture is Mark 15, verses 33 to 35. Let us greet Reverend Matt Carter with a hearty amen. amen. Let us all say amen. amen. Let us praise the Lord together in this place. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Truly I say unto you that today you should be in with me in paradise. Woman, behold the son. Son, behold the mother. Good afternoon to everyone. I Heard someone alluded to we had 10 minutes. I must confess that I never learned how to tell time. <laughs> Just as I began to learn how to tell time, the old bull of a watch I had, the mule stepped on it and broke it. <laughs> so if I begin to get too long, you just stand and wave your hand and just tell me to sit down. <laughs> Amen? Praise God. This is a sacred and holy moment that we come today to commemorate uh, what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
accomplished for us on the cross. We don't take it lightly because it was for our sins, your sins, my sins, for all of our sins that he was there on the cross. He took our place, and we thank God for Jesus. We thank God for Jesus. You have your own Bibles. You, you can read it from 25 through 27. Because uh, I know that you have already read it five or six times before you got here this morning. So we thank God uh, for readers and those that believe and trust in God. But uh, my, the third word tells us that after Jesus had moment those forgiveness and paradise words, uh, the Bible tells us that as he were on the cross, and he looked down from the cross, he saw his beloved mother standing there with his closest friend, the Bible tells us that it is the disciple that Jesus loved. Tradition tells us that this disciple was John, the writer of this text. Jesus had compassion on his mother. He put it like this, look woman, this is your son. Accept him, behold him. From here on, he's gonna be your son. And he said to the disciples, Here's your mother. Take care of her. She's going to need somebody to see after her. I don't know why the question was asked that why did not Jesus a point one of his other brothers to care for Mary, his mother, or one of the other disciples that was in his inner circle. But Jesus even in the agony of his suffering, recognized that there was somebody that, who loved and cared for him. The Bible tells us that John was the one that when they told Jesus that the, the, the disciples told him that they would never leave him. They would not forsake him. Peter told him that he would die with him. He would be there. He won't forsake him. And the rest of them said that likewise. The Bible tells us in John 13, 23, that where Jesus, uh, well, John rested on the bosom of Jesus. You know that where the heart is. You can feel the sincerity. You can feel the love when somebody lean on your bosom. I don't know if you're a mother, if you had children, but if a mother is laying in the bed sometime, lay the bosom, the, 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 the child 
on her breast, upon her chest, upon her bosom. The, the child feels the love that the, child, the, 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 the mother has for the child. Yes, sir. Yes. Do I have a witness in this place today? Yes. So Jesus knew. And he was very sure that John would do what he asked him to do, what he commissioned him to do. Because when uh, Mary was getting older, he, he knew that she was going to have to, some, have to sell someone to look after her. Perhaps Joseph had died and gone on, but the Bible does not tell us that. But I didn't read or research that much, but he knew uh, he, he had to get somebody to take care of his mother. So it tells me that this scripture and this word tells us that Jesus is concerned about family. Jesus is concerned about family. He's concerned about your family, my family, all of our family. He wants us to, be, to take care of the family. He does not want us to fight and have images of one another, envious of one another. The family is to be loved, to be cherished, to be taken care of to the best of our ability. It bothers me to see families fighting over nonsense about nothing. When there's so much going on in the world, so much happening around us, even in, not only in our families, in the home, sometimes in our churches, we see churches being broken up because of the fighting of the family. When we are drafted into God's family, when we are in the body of Christ, we become his servant, and he wants us to love one another. My sisters and brothers, that was love that brought John and Mary together when Jesus was on the cross. In fact, that was love that had him on the cross in the first place. It was alluded to and it was stated before I got up here. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It takes love, my sisters and brothers. It takes love to keep us connected. It takes love to be concerned for one another. It takes love. This text is all about love. My sisters and brothers, I dare but tell us, tell us, but we have to take our eyes and our head out of the air, the sky, and look down at somebody who is going through pain, who are suffering. Jesus saw the hurt, the sorrow on his mother's face. He felt it in his heart. It pierced through her heart and, and he knew and he realized that she needed some help. Like you and I, uh, we need help sometimes. When people step on us and abuse us. Reverend Patina, is we have to let it go. Turn it over to God, and we know that Jesus loved and cared for us. He will send somebody to take care of us. You and I are not left alone. Love will take care of any situation. Love will break down walls. Love will bring people together. Love will continue to bind us as sisters and brothers to love one another. 
God's love is plentiful. He never runs out of love. It's priceless. Because Jesus paid for it already. He paid the debt so we could love. He showed us how to love. He taught us how to live. In his dying, he also taught us how to die. Psalms 91 and 11 say God's love is protected. He will give his angels charge over us to take care of us. That's what he did. He had somebody to take care of his mother. He had somebody in mind to take care of you and to take care of me. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. God's love is permanent. It is not just for one day. It is not just for one year. It is not for just a little while, but it's forever. And what he has given to us and shown to us that we can love like he loved. We can take care of others like he appointed John to do. We can behold a mother when she's down in out. We can take somebody in. You may say, Reverend, I don't have a mother. Yes, you do. This world is full of mothers. It's full of people that you can love and care for. You may be have your agenda, have a, a, a much on your mind, but there are, and things to do. But there's always time to 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 take somebody in to care for them. You was wondering why I was a little late this morning. I was on my way and I I got a call. In fact, I got a call yesterday as I left uh, the dealer to get some done to my car, and uh, a brother former co-worker called me crying and I could not understand what he was saying. I forgot I got this little thing you can push and I can talk on the, you know, but anyway, he asked me if I would pray for him. Now, if you will, in, in your prayer, his name is Danny Gabar. He's from across the water someplace, I don't know, but anyway, I I, I said, I got to stop and pray for you right now. I prayed for him, and, 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 uh, and he said, thank you for your prayer. And this morning on my way, I said, well, just let me just, since I learned how to work it on the way, I punched it and called him, and the great thing did it for me, dialed up, and I asked him how it, things were going. He said, oh, going very well, and thank you for your prayer on yesterday. So, you, you, sister, my sisters and brother, you, so in your time, just pray for him and just pray for me. But God has work for all of us to do. He has uh, something for us to do. It, it may not be to take somebody in, but we can give somebody a helping hand. Somebody needs something that we got. If it's just nothing but just an encouraging word, if it's nothing but just say, God bless you, and God made you, you never know what God will send you and what he will have you to do. And I know my 10 minutes have been up, but I, uh, it, it's all right, but I thank God for that, 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 that Jesus is love, and he, 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 he wants us to behold each other. He wants us to behold a mother. He wants us to behold somebody that is broken. He wants us to behold somebody that is in need of us. Somebody needs a hand. Folks don't always need our money or our hand now. Sometimes people just want our encouragement. Did they say Jesus is on the main line? Just tell him what you want and he will make everything all right. He will take care of you. He will cover everything that you need. God is a good God. He is a caring God. Jesus, he, 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 he knew he had to die. He knew he had to leave out of here. He had to get out of here. We're going to have to leave here. But don't ever 
forget that when God take one thing from us, he, he has something else better to replace that, which we have lost. We, he'll send it to us in ways that we don't understand. When God send you somebody or send you something, accept it and thank God. And say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me sit down. God bless you. I, it, 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 it was, oh, let me turn. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Stand with me. Say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for not coming from the cross. Thank you for looking out in the crowd and seeing me. Seeing me. Seeing you. It was a sermon of love, 
but it was a sermon that demonstrated how we must show love. Yeah. Yeah. You can say it, <laughs> and it remains stationary, but you can say it and make it operational. Yeah. So that's what we need to do is to make the love that we have in our hearts for one another operational. And it goes to, goes to 1 Corinthians, that 13th chapter. We need to read it every day. But not just to read it, but to internalize it and to make it functional in our lives. And we see that Jesus Christ, even on the cross, his compassion and benevolent spirit was directed towards his mother. And he made John the caregiver for his mother. We are a caregiver f for many people. And if it was done then, we can personify it now. Let us become an angel to somebody on a continuous basis. Not just during the holiday. You know, because during the holiday, every organization in the Tri-County area want to donate something, want to donate this. But it's for publicity, some of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But these same people have to eat after January the 1st. That's right. Okay? Right. So our benevolence must be continuous. Our love must be authentic. Amen. And it must be righteous in accordance to what Jesus has shown us on the cross. This is why we go through Good Friday every year, every year, every year, so it can be internalized in us. Yes. But we don't want to leave out of this season this year and go back to how we were last year mm -hmm. right. or the day before. So I'm saying to us and to myself first, let's show some authentic love. Amen. Let's show some forgiveness, yes. you know. And so, let me go on before I get started, okay. Uh, the fourth word, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And it comes from our own Reverend Vanessa Gullah. Amen. 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 Good morning, church family. Good morning. What a blessing it is to be in the house of prayer yet again. Amen? Amen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the text, we find Jesus on Calvary's cross. Just 24 hours before we find him hanging on the cross, just one chapter earlier in Matthew chapter 26, 82 verses from what we find him saying in Matthew 27 and 46, he says to his father that he'd rather forego what is to come on Calvary's cross. The rough place, the uncomfortable place, the place where he would be, just 24 hours later, he asked his father, could he forego that place? Just for a few minutes on today, I'm going to make sure I set my watch and I get 10 minutes <laughs> with my newfangled technology. I'm going to make sure that I don't go over my time. There we go. <laughs> when my, I set my watch. I'm not playing. With my 10 minutes. I just want to talk about what we see from the Calvary's cross when what we pray would not happen does. And when we pray not to be there, we find ourselves there. The places where we don't want to go, that that's exactly where we end up. Uh, see, somewhere along the way, we have uh, taken on some wrong doctrine, and we believe that if we pray, and if we say it loud enough, and if we say it long enough, and if we believe it hard enough, that what we pray does not happen will not happen. Wrong doctrine. 
That's not what the Bible teaches us. That if we pray it right, that if we have the right people to pray, that what we don't want to happen, that it won't happen. That's not biblical. We find in the text that Jesus prayed that the bitter cup would pass from him. We see that Jesus prayed that he did not want to be in that place, that he did not want to suffer what he suffered, that he in his human nature was uncomfortable with what was to come. And in Jesus' words that we hear from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, Lord, my Lord, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? This is the only passage in scripture that we see that Jesus does not refer to God as his father. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We know that Jesus in his human, in his human state, though he knew that God was his father, though he was eternally, I, I, I've heard, I, can I just say real quick, I'm about to get in trouble now. We've heard it preached. Ah, oh, that, you know, Jesus was separated from God and that he was no longer connected to him. Because Jesus is divine, because he's a part of the Holy Trinity, there was never a time he could be separated from the Father. Can I just, can I? I'm, I, I'm, I just, I, okay, all right, all right. Let me get back in my place. I'm using up my 10 minutes. Though Jesus finds himself in his humanity, overwhelmed by his circumstance, in the place that he prayed that he would not be. We actually see that even though he felt that way, it was not that Jesus felt that God was not doing his job. Jesus himself, he's teaching us how to deal with disappointments. He's, he's teaching us how to deal with that place that we don't want to be. He's teaching us how to deal with those things that we don't necessarily want to deal with. Uh, other than that, we see here that if we make a request to God, the truth is it's up to God to decide what he's going to do. What we have to understand is that there's always purpose in those places we don't want to be. God had a plan, and Jesus said, it, it is your will. If it is your plan, help me to endure. But even in that moment, he was overwhelmed in his humanity. I just stopped by to encourage somebody and let you know that we can find God in the places we don't want to be. Uh, as I prepared, as I prayed and meditated about this lesson, uh, it's funny, I, uh, there were two media stories that were coming out that I'm really um, kind of sensitive to. Um, I have children that are, will be 28 and 30 this year. I don't know how since I'm only 29 and Frank's only 30. <laughs> I don't know how that mathematical impossibility is happening. Uh, but I find myself talking to them often. I find myself talking to young people often and hearing their frustrations. Their frustrations about their unhappy uh, existences and how there are so many things that are going on. Uh, you heard about the U.S. happiness score, uh, where the United States has fallen from number 15 to number 23, first time in the, the history of the survey that we've gone that far. And, and they want to blame it on the 30-somethings. Uh, see, the 30-somethings, the millennials, those under 30, those were the ones who said that they were most unhappy. They're unhappy with the economy. They're unhappy with social support. They're unhappy with their life expectancy and health challenges. They're unhappy with their freedom. They're unhappy with people's lack of generosity, and they're unhappy with the corruption. They scored that said they were not happy. Uh, they find themselves in a place where they're frustrated, where they're overwhelmed, and they said for the places that they prayed not to be, you're going to get it in a minute, that's exactly where they are. Uh, these people who are under 30, these ones who are going through what they call the pink millennials, um, those 20s and 30-somethings, the biggest part of this year's generation, these young people are frustrated. They're frustrated with life, and a lot of them say that they're not in the place where they want to be. I just want to let you know that some of them not even are not in the place where they want to be, but they're angry with God. Uh, if you would let them tell it, they, they feel abandoned. Uh, like Jesus. They find themselves in the places where they didn't think they would be because they studied and they prepared. They find themselves in the places that they don't want to be because they feel like they did everything right. I have a message today to encourage with you with this passage. For our young people and for us where we are right now, from Calvary's cross, what we can learn today is that God can be found in the places we don't want to be. 
He, he can be found in the times in our lives where we pray not to be there. He can be found in the places in our lives that we feel abandoned and we weren't expecting to be in that place. Our God is if we call on him, he will be near. When Jesus cries out, he cries out in his human nature, but also he was crying out not just from his humanity, but he was crying out from his divinity. See, Jesus was preaching a message and we didn't know he was preaching. Uh, he, he was telling us something that we didn't understand. When he cries out, why has God forsaken him? He wasn't saying that he lost his faith, but he was alluding to Psalm 22. He, he knew that the people that were there, he knew that the saints that were there would understand the message that he was preaching, which is to say is that there is pain and there is prayer, but there's also promise and there's also praise. He, he wanted to let them know that even though in my humanity I don't want to go through this and I feel like I have been forsaken, the reality is, is that I've just been a little bit shaken. Uh, can I get an amen? Uh, sometimes we think that we've been forsaken and our feelings may tell us that we've been forsaken, but it's just a little shaken up. Uh, it's just a little bit of the Lord doing what he does and him doing his plan. What we have to understand is we're entitled to feel what we feel, but our feelings are not always God's truth. Let, let, let me say that again. We're entitled to feel what we feel, but often what we think is, is that we think that God is doing something he shouldn't be, but the reality is, is that our frustration does not have to impact our faith. What we have to understand is, is that the enemy has a job. The enemy of our soul, his, his, his desire is, in those places where we don't want to be, is to tell us that God doesn't hear us. And that God does not care about us. But what we see from Calvary's cross is that we have a new beginning. Amen. There's a new beginning in every situation. Don't let the difficulty lead you to the place where you are in denial and you distrust God. Hey, we have to hang on to God and know that victory is coming. In Psalm 22, verse 8, it says, commit yourself to the Lord and let him deliver you. We have to understand that even when we are in the places we don't want to be, even when we find ourselves in the place where we feel abandoned by God, God's plan lets us know that he is right there. Victory remains possible. Verse 19 tells us in Psalm 22 that he's not far off from us and that we can ask for his assistance. Then verse 24 says, you have not hidden your face from me, O God. When I cried, you heard me. I don't know if the message is for you or it may be for some of the 20 and 30-somethings in your life that feel like they're in the place where they don't want to be, but the devil has a plan. He wants them to feel uncomfortable and he wants to lead them to distraction. He wants to give them disinformation that leads them to the place where they want to dismiss what God has said. And then when they dismiss what God has said, he wants them to forego being dependent upon him. We cannot live this life without being dependent upon the Lord. Jesus didn't want the cross. He said it himself, let this bitter cup pass from me. But in his submission to God, he showed us that we need to be fully dependent, even in our frustration. This life is going to bring frustration. I was telling the ministers, Lord forgive me, uh, that I started calling people nutter butters. I don't know about you, but there are situations that become frustration in life. Reverend Fatima talked about it, and you just feel overwhelmed, and you don't like the place that you're in, right? You pray not to be there. You don't want to be there. But the reality is, in that, we do not want to get distracted. That leads to us denying God's uh, faithfulness to us. I, I just wanted to tell you on today, with my 10 minutes, got seven seconds left. I just wanted to let you know that even though you may feel forsaken, sometimes the Lord is just doing a little shaking.
understand that we are given new beginnings and that we are never forsaken as men and women in Christ. We may feel that we're a little lonely. We may feel a little uh, uh, off course. We may feel a little misdirected at times. But we're never forsaken. God so loved the world, and he loves us. And we have to understand sometimes when we are being navigated in, the diff, in a different direction, we have to look at that and say, God, what's your plan? God, what's your purpose? Because in many instances when God gets ready to give us new beginnings. He has to separate us from some people and from some things. So let's declare today 
that this is a new season in Christ Jesus. What God has for you, it is for you. And no one can snatch that away because that's God's plan. So if you're feeling a little lonely and forsaken today, know that God loves you. That you were one of the purposes for the cross. We're getting ready to hear um, the Right Reverend, uh, Dr. Craig Esther, and uh, his title is, I Thirst. Let's greet him with a hearty amen. Amen. I thirst. John 19 and 28, I need to read it. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. I like this. I like this word from the cross, and I did a historical study on the crucifixion. And one thing that I learned in my study is that in order to understand why Jesus said, I thirst, you first must understand what he meant by the scriptures being fulfilled. Because it's very important to know the whole text so that you don't run off with him being thirsty, thinking he was thirsty because he wanted something to drink. Because that's the first thing we think when somebody says, I'm thirsty, is that I need something to drink. I need something to get down in me. But if we look at this verse closely, there is a whole lot to be learned from it if we really pay attention. First of all, the scripture says it was later in the day, which helps us to understand now that in the crucifixion process, Jesus has been on the cross for a long time. He, he, he's been up there, he's, he's been on that cross, he's been, he's been going through some things and, and, and he's been there, he, he, he's been there and the good thing about it is that he didn't come down. It's later in the day. And, 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 and the writer John links the statement, I thirst, to the fulfillment of the scripture. Oh, Lord, how did he do that, preacher? Because if you go back and look in the Old Testament, I told you I did a historical study. And in the Old Testament, when Jesus says, I thirst, John links that to where at least 20 Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled during God, Jesus' time on the cross. John puts the spotlight on the Old Testament scriptures that were being fulfilled because he wanted to show us that everything was going according to God's plan. Everything was going according to God's plan. When Jesus says, I thirst from the cross, what he does is give reference to the prophecy in Psalm 22 and 15, where, he said, where David says, my mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. A pot shirt, just so you understand what that is. A pot shirt is a piece of fragmented pottery that has been baked by the sun. It's, it, it, it's one piece that the sun hits more than the others, and, and, and it becomes baked. Jesus says, I'm baked. I'm hot. I need something to drink. And when he says, I thirst, these, 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 there's some evil hearts in the camp. 
You better know that everywhere you go, everybody ain't happy to see you. That there, there, there's some evil hearts in the camp. You better know that everybody, like my mama used to say, smile in your face will turn around and stab you in your back. Ah, there's some evil hearts in the place. You better understand that just because you want to be with somebody don't mean somebody want to be with you. He, he, he says, I'm hot, and, 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 and he asks for something to drink. And, 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 and the evil hearts, Jewish leaders gave him what was known as wine vinegar to drink. Y'all know that, right? Gave him wine vinegar to drink. This wine vinegar was considered the cheapest brand of wine. It would be like us drinking wild Irish rose. I'm dating myself now. Or, or, or any other cheap wine you know of today, because I don't know the wines of today. So whatever you might know, it would be like drinking that. This, this, this vinegar wine was drunk by those men who stood around the crosses because they had to be there until the criminals died. So they would drink wine in the sun, but they would drink cheap wine. And you know, you know they say that cheap wine is the one that you don't forget because sometimes it'll make your bed spin. Uh, they were waiting for the criminals to die. Jesus asked for a drink to fulfill scripture in Psalm 69 and 21, where David says again, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Jesus is on the cross. It's late now in the day. And he says, I thirst. He says, I thirst because he's fulfilled scripture. I hope you are walking with me now. Because this is where it begins to turn. Because Jesus is now saying, I thirst because he realizes that everything that he has been asked to do, y'all read it in 19, has been done. And now I'm thirsty. My God, I thirst, he says. He didn't say it so that he could quench his thirst. I want you to know that. That's not why he said, I'm thirsty. It is said that he said, I'm thirsty, not so he could relieve himself of what he knew because he already had completed his purpose. It is said that he said he is thirsty, not so he could get attention because he already had everybody's attention all week long. Uh, uh, why did Jesus say, I thirst? He didn't say it so that he could get fame or fortune. He wasn't looking for nobody to pat him on the back. I'm getting ready to sit down, as y'all can tell. He wasn't looking for nobody to, to, to ring his bell. He wasn't looking for nobody to shout, oh yeah, Jesus did it, he did it. You know, like we do, we want everybody to call our name when we do something. Why did Jesus say, I thirst? He didn't say it because he wanted you to look good. Jesus said, I thirst. And he was saying it in the words of the rapper, hip hop rapper, DJ Cool, he said, I thirst because all he was letting them know is he wanted to clear his throat. He wanted to clear 
his throat. Why did he want to clear his throat? Because what he was getting ready to say next was going to be one of the greatest foundational things that could have ever been said when he was on the cross. He said, I thirst because he wanted to clear his throat, y'all. He wanted to clear his throat so that everybody in the area would hear what he would have to say next. I'm not going to say what he says next because we got a preacher coming that's going to tell you what he said next. But I want you to know that Jesus said, I thirst because he wanted to clear his throat. He wanted to make sure that everybody heard what he was getting ready to say because it wasn't just for him, but it was going to be for all of us what he's getting ready to say next. Let me clear my throat, he said, because I, I want to make sure y'all get it and you get it good. Let me clear my throat, he says, because I want to make sure you handle what I'm getting ready to say to you. Let me clear my throat. Because what I'm about to say to you, if you trust me, is going to be the blessing for the rest of your life. I, I hope today now that preachers won't just run till I'm thirsty. Because all that means is I need a drink. No, Jesus said it because he had completed what he came to do. And now I need y'all to hear. But because I've been up here so long, I just need something to loosen my tongue from the roof of my mouth so that when I speak, I'll be heard. When I speak, it'll be clear. When I speak, you'll understand what I'm saying. When I speak, you'll know what to do. When I speak, you'll hear what I have to say. And as I close and go to my seat, I'm done. He said I thirst because he wanted to clear his throat. Y'all got that? As I go to my seat, I ask the question, what are you thirsty for? Are you thirsty for the diamonds and rubies of this world? Or are you thirsty for your salvation in Christ? What are you thirsty for? Are you looking for people to pat you on your back? Or are you thirsty and understand that as long as your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you don't have anything else to worry about. Forget about these folk that's really holding you down when, they, when you think they're lifting you up. And remember that Jesus did what he did so that we wouldn't have to depend on people, but we can depend on him. I thirst. New Prospect Mass Choir. I just love when we sing together. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole
you've done for me. She said, I'll never forget how you set me free. She said, I'll never forget how you brought me out. She said, I'll never forget, no, never. Oh, precious. together and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Let us continue to thirst for Jesus. That's a good thirst for us to have. It should be continuous. And there is always an opportunity <clears throat> to clear your throat. <laughs> We've had some dynamic sermons this morning. We thank God for the preachers in this congregation. Now we will hear from Reverend May Alexander. And it is the sixth word. It is entitled, It Is Finished. Let's greet Reverend May Alexander with a hearty amen. Amen? God bless you. My father's children my sisters and my brothers in Christ. We praise God for another opportunity to say a word. If you don't mind, let me establish a little protocol here. I was always taught that that is what you do. I'm in my house, but there are folk that are over me. And I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the presence of part of our pastoral staff, Reverend Cardinal Richardson, our lead pastoral minister, Reverend Dr. Craig Diesta, Reverend Dr. April Hearn in her absence, yes. to our beautiful MC or facilitator, yes. Reverend Natlin Hoshton, yes. and to our beautiful music ministry, Sister Sherry. God bless you, my sister. I thank you so much. Thank you so much. And one of our psalmists, Sister Deborah Housie. Yes. We thank God. We thank God for each and every one of you. I know this has been a lengthy experience, but I truly hope that you have received the food that you need on this Good Friday. I bless each and every one of you that's under the sound of my voice to those that are watching via live stream and Facebook. We honor your presence as well. Amen. Dr. Craig, I don't know, he has set this thing up for me. <laughs> I hope I'm able to deliver. Praise God. I thank you, Dr. Craig. Sister Gully, my soulmate, we have the same birthday. You set your watch because mine stopped about six months ago and I have not, <laughs> I have not gotten another battery. 
and I can get it free. But I just can't get out there to get it. But all kidding aside, we bless the presence of God. This is a holy time. This is a special time. All of the messages have been so inspiring to me. They talked about being at a place that you're uncomfortable with. But God is doing something. And we don't always understand the ways of the Lord. For he said his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. So we kind of teeter-totter in the situation until God sees fit to fix it. So let us pray before we go into our message. Eternal God, our Father, we come before you this afternoon to first thank you for this day and for all of our blessings. We thank you for all that you've done and for what you're going to do and what you're doing right now. We pray now that as we prepare to speak to your people, that you will let your anointing fall fresh upon us right now. Prepare your people to receive your word that will hopefully impact their lives to be better disciples. Cover me, your preacher, with your precious blood. And let it be your word, your will, and your way. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. May your name be glorified, your son Jesus magnified, and the Holy Spirit satisfied. In the name of Jesus we pray. And let the saints of God say amen. amen. As we continue to reflect upon the road to Calvary, it is now the day of the crucifixion. And for just a few minutes, let's revisit that sad day when he cried out several times from the cross. The sixth cry that he said, after he said, I thirst, to clear his throat, that you may be able to hear clearly what he wanted to say. That word, it is finished. It is finished. You can find that in John 19, the 19th chapter and the 30th verse, and it reads, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now we all know, we all know, and we've heard it years and years and year after year. We've heard it today. We know the story of the crucifixion of Christ. After all, we've heard this story and saw movies all of our adult life. Even as children, we were aware of the Easter story and Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection. I cried when I was asked to do the sixth word uttered by Christ on the cross on that fateful day because I can only imagine the pain and the suffering that he endured before he uttered these words, it is finished. We as children before reaching adulthood and most of us have children of our own and grandchildren, we had chores to do. And now we delegate chores to our children, our grandchildren. We knew we would be in trouble if we did not complete. Somebody say finish. finish. 
finish our chores. When we were in school, we had homework assignments. And if we did not complete, finish our project, we would receive a failing grade. On our jobs, we, were we had responsibilities that had to be completed. And what? Finished. Finish. Or we would be without a job. Mm -hmm. And in the unemployment line of the welfare line. <laughs> We've all had forms that needed to be completed. What? Finished. Finish. So people would have a clear view as to who we are or what our needs were. We complete sentences. We finish what we're saying to make people understand. No one stops in the middle of a sentence and expect folk to understand what we're saying. Finish is an adjective, according to the dictionary. One explanation is of a person having completed or ended an action or activity. One of the seven words uttered by Christ on the cross, none is more important than the six words. It is finished. Found only in the Gospel of John, 19 and 30, the word translated from the Greek word tetelestial, is an accounting term that means what? Paid in full. When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring the debt owed to his father and that it would be wiped away completely and forever. Not that Jesus wiped away any debt that he owed to the Father. Rather, Jesus eliminated the debt owed by mankind, the debt of sin. As we travel back just a bit, Jesus was born to pay the ultimate price of death for the sins of the world. He was sent to earth in the form of a human a man to teach, preach, heal, perform miracles, cast out demons. He turned water into wine at a wedding. You can read that in John, the second chapter, three through nine. He fed 5,000 men, women, and children with just two fish and five barley loaves of bread. And he even raised the dead. He was a miracle worker who gave sight to the blind healed the leopards, encouraged the man that had laid at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years to take up your bed and walk. So much good Jesus did, knowing that soon he would have to fulfill the mission that had been assigned to him by his father. Just prior to his arrest, by the Roman soldiers, Jesus prayed his last public prayer, asking his father to glorify him just as Jesus had glorified the father. Having finished the work, you have given me to do. The work Jesus was sent to do was to seek and to save that which was lost, to provide atonement for the sins of all who would ever believe in him. I have scriptures, but I'm not going to take up the time to give them to you. If you want to see me after service, I'll be happy to give them to you, and you can call and kind of follow what I'm saying. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. 
and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Read it in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 verses. None other but God in the flesh could accomplish such a task. As we move on to the days coming up to the crucifixion, we know the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed asking his father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, I'm talking about Jesus, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. As the will of God was fulfilled, his son was betrayed by Judas and taken into captivity in the same garden of Gethsemane where they knew he went to pray. And while he was still praying, Jesus was arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin council. He was found guilty of crimes he did not commit. Herod, with his men, treated Jesus with contempt and mocked him. Uh, he was beaten, defamed, ridiculed, and after all of that, they put on him a gorgeous robe and sent him to Pilate. After hearing the charges against Jesus, he was that he was misleading the people with his teachings, Pilate said, I have found no fault in this man concerning these things of which you accuse him. No, neither does Herod. I will therefore chastise him and release him. They all cried away with this man, crucify him. They continued to cry out. So Pilate gave in to their cries. Y'all know how they do. All you got to do is watch some of the politicians. All you got to do is cry loud enough and hard enough and say what they want to hear, and they'll give in. And they gave sentence that it should be as they requested. His life was sacrificed for a sinner, Barabbas. As Jesus was led away, Simon, a Cyrenian, Cyrenian, I'm sorry, who was coming from the country, they laid the cross on him that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus walked with the cross upon his shoulders, stumbling and falling, until he reached the destination of his demise called Calvary. The hill near Jerusalem, the name in Latin is Latin for place of the skull. It is also called Golgotha. They laid him on the cross. They nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. Then they raised the cross to place it firmly in the soil. And I can just imagine Jesus saying, if I, come on somebody, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. A crown of thorns was placed on his head as they crowned him king of the Jews. They tormented him by giving him vinegar to drink. They parted his garments and pierced him in the side. They even cast lots. They gambled to see who would get his garment. The cross was placed between two men who had been sentenced as thieves and condemned to crucifixion. One of the thieves showed no respect for Jesus, but the other thief knew he had done wrong. And he cried out to Jesus to remember him when you come into your kingdom. Jesus hung on the cross 
from the sixth to the ninth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth. The sun refused to shine, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus cried out several times. We call it the seven last words from the cross. He looked towards heaven and said to his father, it is finished. The sixth cry from the cross. I have finished, Father, the work that you sent me to do. It is finished. He could have come down from the cross, but he decided to die just to save me. One songwriter said this, living he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sin far away. Rising, he justified and freed me forever. One day, he's coming back. It'll be a glorious day. I don't know about you today, but I want to let you know as I leave the podium that on Christ, the solid rock I stand. Come on now. All other ground, I don't care where you stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I dare not trust right. the sweetest friend. How am I doing, Reverend Vanessa? Time to come down. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. There is room. At the cross for you. There is room at the cross for you. You may be high, you may be poor, you may be rich.
road to Calvary. Our bags are already packed. There's room at the cross for us. Reverend May Alexander talk, talked about it being finished. He finished it for our justification, our reconciliation, and the debts of our sins were on the cross. So we thank the Lord Jesus Christ for what all he did for us before we even committed ourselves to him. So we have to look at that. We're on our road to Calvary. Reconciliation, justification. It is finished. It is finished. So the seventh word indicates, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Father, into thy hands. I commit my spirit. This is going to be done by our lead pastor, Reverend Carnell Richardson. Let's give him a hearty amen as he comes. Thank you, Lord. Karen, if you could give me the overflow lights as well. Put me down. Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the SUN, the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Just for a few moments, I want to talk about God's plan. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's been a long battery of hours for Jesus. Arrested in Gethsemane, six criminal trials, three by the Jews and three by the Romans now sentenced to death. Now on Friday, Jesus finds himself suspended between heaven and earth, suffering unto the end. His friends have left him. His mother can't help him. How did we get here? Weren't we just laying palm branches on the road last Sunday? Weren't we just singing Hosanna? How did we go from a parade to a crime scene? Weren't we just singing Hosanna? You see, this scene here is sandwiched between the high Hosannas of Sunday and the Easter lilies of the next but not without the agony of Friday. <laughs> Between the palms of Passion Sunday and, and the lilies of, of this coming Sunday is a cross. And Jesus hangs there at this crime scene. Crucified. In antiquity, crucifixion was considered to be a very vicious and disgraceful method by which to die. It was practiced by the Assyrians and 
the Babylonians and was also used methodically by the Persians in the 6th century. And we should note that the Romans did not use this method for their own citizens. Crucifixion in Roman times was applied to slaves and discredited soldiers and foreigners. And there was, however, extensive torture and humiliation of victims who were executed in public sites during that day. It was a horrific experience to watch people, victims of crucifixion, suffer immensely as their death was slow. And to add insult to injury, they were generally crucified while naked. Crucifixion was made to be the most atrocious and dreadful of punishments. And everything possible was done to make it appear such. And here hangs Jesus, about to take his last breath. Death by crucifixion usually occurred after six hours and could have at times taken up to four days. Death was usually due to the after effects of the obligatory scourging and maiming and hemorrhaging and dehydration causing hypovolemic shock where several fluid is, is lost from the body making it impossible for the heart to pump an adequate amount of blood to the body and excruciating pain to take over and the most significant factor was progressive asphyxia triggered by the impairment of respiratory movement Jesus is suffering his body has been broken he can barely breathe he's going in and out of shock and cardiac arrest is a reality and now he has the inertia and it thronging his body and it's all felt in his chest Jesus is suffering he has severe pain from the bodily blows and the breaking of, his, of, of, of all that is within him. And in crucifixion, ropes may have been used to draw out the life of the crucified person and increase the suffering. This was a painful experience. Roman guards on duty could only leave the crucifixion site after the victim had died and were known to hurry death by means of, watch this, intentional fracturing of the fibula, spear stab wounds into the heart, sharp blows to the front of the chest, or a smoking fire built at the foot of the cross to cause more asphyxiation. The victims were generally left to decompose on their crosses or they have, could have been consumed by a wild beast. Here Jesus takes all of this punishment, all of this pain, all of this suffering, not because of what he did, but because of your sin and my sin. Here Jesus suffers physically after having been up all night long and marched from place to place. Here, here Jesus suffers after having been in several different hands, betrayed in the hands of sinners, placed into the hands of Pilate. Pilate, Reverend V, wanted to let him go kept on begging the crowd to reconsider their decision to put this man to death but some of the same people who cried Hosanna on Sunday were now saying crucify him at the end of the week some of the same people who were asking him to save them now want him dead so now he, he's, been, he's been in the hands of sinners he's been in Pilate's hands he's been slapped by the hands of accusers and prosecutors in the presence of the high priest but now in the hour of death 
Jesus, having been passed from hand to hand, now calls on the one who has the best hands. Jesus now calls on the one who has taken his hand and made man in the out of the dust of the earth. Jesus now puts all in his hands, this and that. He puts everything in the hands of his father. Psalm 31, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. I don't know about you, but I looked at this. Jesus was fulfilling the scripture. He told his disciples in John 16 and 10, I'm going to the Father. He tells them that in a little while, you won't see me any longer. I don't know about you, but I want you to, I, how you feel, but I want you to know that Jesus, his hand, Jesus knows that God's hands are the best hands to be in. He knows that the Father's hands are trustworthy. The Father's hands won't fail him. The Father's hands won't let him down. The Father's hands won't forsake him. The Father's hands won't drop him. The Father's hands won't abuse him. The Father's hands won't leave him. The Father's hands are safe hands. I don't know about you. In my hour of death, I want to be like Stephen, the first deacon in Acts, when they were killing Stephen. He looked up to heaven and said, Lord Jesus, Jesus, receive my spirit. At the end of my life, I want to be able to say, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. I want to go when I when, when, when I die, hallelujah, by and by. I want to be able to say, Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus, Jesus here, after he finished his work of preaching the gospels, teaching the parables, healing the sick, raising the dead, saying it is finished. Now he can go to the Father at the hour of death. I tell you, this is quite an experience that Jesus goes through. And I don't know about you, but in my hour of death, I want the blessed assurance that I can skip hell and go to heaven. I want the blessed assurance that I know where I'm going, that I don't have to guess that I'm going to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. I don't want any mistake about I want to know without the shadow of a doubt that in my hour of death, the one who made me is receiving me unto himself. Whether it's, whether it's 30 years from now, 50, 90, years from now we don't know how much time we got left but I don't know about you in your final hour you should want to say father into thy hands I commit my spirit knowing that you're going to a place where the wicked will cease from trouble and the weary will be at rest do I have any Christians up in here who says when I die hallelujah by and by I'll fly away to a place where joy never ends but on good friday on good friday all i can say as i end this sermon is down at the cross where my savior died down where for cleansing of sin i cried there to my heart was the blood applied i'm singing glory to his name i am so wondrously saved from my sins because of calvary jesus so wondrously abides within because of calvary there at the cross where he took me in i'm singing glory to his name oh precious fountain that saves from sin I'm so glad that I've entered in there Jesus saved me and kept me clean I'm singing glory to his name anybody up in here on good Friday singing glory to his name because it got dark and he died and the centurion said this has got to be the son of God it's dark it's dark it's dark because it has to be there's no other way that our salvation could have been accomplished but by this suffering and the suffering servant as Reverend McCarter told us teaches us how to die if you ever 
seen someone die before. And unfortunately, now I have so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Craig, we both we've yeah. been to hospital rooms. It's a painful experience. Yeah. But it's also a blessed experience yeah. to know that when it's all over, There is a God who will receive us unto himself. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He did breathe his last and gives up the ghost and goes back to the Father. And if you know him, yeah. when you die, yeah. you can go to the Father. The doors to the church are open. There just might be somebody here today who doesn't know. Who doesn't know about this Christ? doesn't know. Brother Cotton, will you open those doors for me? Uh, Sister Yvette, oh, I, didn't, I forgot she was on duty. If you're not here today, you don't know the Lord. And the pardon of your sin. We invite you to give your life to him, believing that he died. up the coast and he died and he was buried and yes he's risen but we ain't out there yet but he is risen this long week of suffering Jesus died he didn't go to sleep he didn't go into unconsciousness he died a real death you all may be seated he died on a dark cold Friday he died. A crime, I tell you, a crime was committed and the mood was just somber. He, he died. Until the earth shook. And the people around realized this was the Son of God. Yeah. It was a dark Friday. women standing there helpless they followed him they have trusted in him his homeboys have gone off hiding and Jesus is dead
powers of darkness feel like they have them right where they want them. No more preaching. No more raising from the dead. No more meeting widows at the cemetery at Nain and giving their sons back. No more calling Lazaruses from tombs. We got Jesus right where we want him. He's dead on Good Friday. Please stand as we prepare to dismiss. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We were all there. Our sins were there. Our powers of darkness put Jesus to death not even knowing that there's a greater plan. Drake said, there's a lot of bad things that they're wishing on me. That's Jesus' story. They put him to death on a Friday. I know you know what happens on Sunday, but we're not there yet. So as we leave the sanctuary in silence, not yet, let me finish my last sentences. Leave pondering the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus has made at Calvary for you and me. And in the stillness of Good Friday, and the strangeness of Holy Saturday. Let's anticipate, since we know the story, the joy of Sunday morning. Because Jesus saw the, the joy that was set before him and took on the cross, despising his shame. But on Good Friday, let us marinate on, think about what the Lord has done for us. Till we meet again, go in peace.